Good morning. We have a tradition that on Saturday, sometime between 11.30 and 12.15, somebody gets up and uh, talks while you rest. It's interesting that uh, this is pure tradition. There's nothing in the Bible that says that this is how you're supposed to keep Sabbath. But we do it. Tradition, and all traditions are not good and not at all bad. Pastor asked if I would fill in. He's on at camp meeting. And uh, the last time I spoke here, I'm quite sure that nobody remembers what I said. You got it, pagoda. So I didn't uh, to, to, to use up time. You remember what I talked about in the parable of the pagoda? Foundation. Foundation. One of the points I tried to make that the pagoda is a parable of your religious philosophy or the philosophy of your life and the reason pagodas have lasted so long in human history is that their joints are strong but loose. Strong but loose, suggesting that your religious philosophy, if it is too tight and too brittle, it might fall. Also, in the center of the pagoda, I had the thing that stabilized it called the simbashur, and it hung from the top and it did not reach the ground and it acted like a pendulum. And I suggested this represents your idea of God. And it stabilizes the pagoda when there are earthquakes. And I had a crummy model pagoda here that demonstrated how it didn't fall over when uh, the earthquakes came. Have any of you heard of the string theory? Can any of you explain the string therapy? Good, because now I'll explain it and nobody can disagree with me. (laughs) String theory and the key word is theory, is something that theoretical physics geniuses are working on to try to explain things in physics that they cannot explain. There are forces in nature that really bother theoretical physicists, and one is gravity. We know what gravity is, but we can't explain why it is. One is electromagnetic forces. Why are there magnetic forces in nature, and one is the strong force and one is the weak force in the nucleus of an atom. And so they have come up with this theory called the string theory about something that is so incredibly small that it only has one dimension. Now, if you can conceive of something with only one dimension, we live in a three-dimensional place, back and forth, up and down, three dimensions. This thing only has one dimension and the way this thing vibrates explains maybe all these other forces that are mysterious to us. Now string theorists only talk to other string theorists. (laughs) And they're trying to describe something mathematically that cannot be seen. Now, how do you do an experiment on something that cannot be seen? How can you prove it's right? How can you prove it's wrong? String theory. I'm going to propose a theoretical question to you before I present my string theory. Let's say that you are approached by a neighbor, a good friend, a relative, somebody you work with, and they come to you and say, I know that you are a Christian. 
I've got all kinds of problems in my life. I've got relationship problems, I've got financial problems, I've got health problems. I know you believe in the Bible. It seems to have given you some evenness in your life. Can you tell me why you believe in the Bible? Why do you believe that story? It's a fantastic story. I mean, it just starts out, there's a God, and he created everything just like that. He spoke of it, and there it was, and then there was sin, and then there was death and destruction, and then there's this story of human history, and then God himself comes down into the human history, and he dies, and he's resurrected, and then he goes on, and, and the story goes on, it says, and then ultimately, there's a resurrection, and there's heaven, and everything is... There's no other story like that any place in any human literature. Why do you believe such a story? Could you tell them? The reason I believe a story is, uh, well, the pastor believes it. My mother believed it. You just have to have faith. Then you can believe it. The evangelist came and he had nice hair and straight teeth and a real nice tie and he believed it. How would you convince them that this is a true story? Have you, you know, there's that old song, I'm going to sit right down and write myself a letter and make believe it came from you. It's a love story. You could say, I make believe it came from God. Is the Bible such a story? Well, let me um, get my string. Now, I hope I don't get this all tangled up. But this, <clears throat> this represents the string of human history. Now, there are many good, honest Bible students, archaeologists, Christians, who would suggest that human history is much more than 6,000 years old. And I'm not here today to argue that point one way or another. But I don't need to make this string longer to make my point. This string this is 60 feet long. And I would like to suggest that each foot represents 100 years. And so here's some points in Christian history hanging here. The last one right up here is Luther. There's Christ, there's Daniel, there's Abraham, there's Noah, and there's Adam against the far wall. It is coming up on the 500-year history of Luther's nailing the thesis to the door, just 500 years ago. I want you to ask the question that Christ asks. Check the fig tree. What time is it? Now, Adventists have a history that started with people predicting when Christ was going to return and they were wrong, William Miller was wrong, and the remains of that small group started Adventism. And they took the name Adventists, which we don't promote like we used to promote. We don't talk about the Advent a great deal. Those of you who are older remember the, the a magazine, Signs of the Times. Are any of you ordering signs of the times? One. Anybody else? 
It used to be that we would have signs of the times campaigns in the church. And if you had an interest in Adventism, you would get their address and they would send them the times. We have one person that still gets the signs. Well, what time is it? Which is another title that I could have asked or could have given to my sermon. What time is it? I would like you just to listen to a minute to a verse in Daniel. The last chapter of Daniel is talking about the end of time. And there's a lot in that chapter that I have a hard time making sense of. But this one verse, Daniel 12, and the fourth verse, But you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal up the book until the time of the end when many will rush here and there and knowledge will increase. You remember the story, the great prediction in Matthew 24, when Christ, you know, was leaving the temple and they were remarking on the beauty of the temple and Christ said, you know, this isn't going to last. This beautiful temple you see here, there won't be one stone left upon another. And this was their most important real estate in their whole world and their philosophy and they took him aside and said tell us when is this going to happen and then there's the, this prophecy in Matthew 24 which is a prophecy about the end of the Jewish, uh, Judaic nation in AD 70 but it also is a double prophecy talking about the end of the world and then there's a very interesting thing there was the scripture reading Christ says now learn a lesson from the fig tree when its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout you know that the summer is near suggesting that you could look out in the world see what's happening and know when christ is coming you read down a couple of verses however my version says no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. One verse, Christ says, try to read the signs of the times. And a verse, he says, letter, he says, but you know, you really can't know. It's interesting if you read on to the next chapter, and there weren't any chapters originally, it goes on to talk about the parable of the ten virgins. And you know that parable, five wise, five foolish, and so on. At the end of that parable, he's telling, he says, Matthew 25, 13. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. There it is, all in one verse. Keep watch because you don't know. Or you can't know. But keep watch. Well, what time is it in Earth's history? How many times have you heard people talking about, quotes, the signs of the end. It possibly, cannot possibly go on any longer. Well, let's look at several different things that I think are interesting, and you could probably add all kinds of other things in your world. But these are things that you can see and ponder that are happening in our world right now, and one let's talk with them, start out with finance. This thing called money, this thing called wealth, what is it? In our modern world, what you have a few years ago was green paper with numbers printed on it. Before that, you might have actually had gold or silver or something else. But now, basically, we don't even have green paper with money, numbers printed on it. We have a number in a computer at a bank or a savings and loan or a brokerage. It's purely a number in a computer. That's all you've got. And you have a credit card. Really, it's an IOU card. It says to people that you give it to, you can take and reduce the number in this mythical account that I have at the bank. 
and put those numbers in your mythical account at the bank. And this is our, how many of you have recently seen a Brinks truck running around? There's still some out there. But basically, you don't need those anymore. It's all done with a computer, just transferring numbers from one account to another. You say, I own stock. Do you really have any stock certificates? No, there's some broker that has a number in his account or your account someplace, and that's all you really have. And that phenomena has just happened in the little last piece of the rope. And people have worried, well, if there's a nuclear explosion at a high altitude with electromagnetic pulsation, it will wipe out all the computers. I guess that's true. I don't know. What would happen to our wealth if that happened? Would also wipe out our electric grid. What would happen to us if those two little wires that came to your house didn't work? What would happen to the gas station? What would happen to the Safeway? What would happen to your refrigerator or your air conditioner or your computer? Talk a little bit about farming. If you go back one foot in this human history string, 80% of the populace was farming. Now, 3% of the populace is farming. That's all in the last foot. Our friend Richard Detter is over at camp meeting. I don't know if you know that his brother runs this ranch up in Alberta, which he helped. Richard goes up and helps him plant and helps him harvest. And the farm that he has in Alberta is now up to 30,000 acres. And when he takes these machines out to plant and to harvest, which cost a half a million dollars each, and they got a bunch of them, they're GPS guided, and they have a computer on board that steers it. It tells them how much to plant, how good the soil is, and it tells them exactly where the thing is going to go. And when the bin gets full and the truck needs to come when they're harvest and take the grain away, they don't stop. The machine keeps rolling along and the truck comes up next to it and it hooks onto the GPS in the tractor which is hooked onto the satellite and it controls the truck and unloads it and the truck drives off. How long has that been in human history? Well, what about wealth? We enter into live in an interesting world where there are probably two billion people on the face of our earth that are getting by on less than two dollars and fifty cents a day and there are five hundred million people on the face of the earth that make more than a million dollars a year this great disparity in wealth, which is potentially unstable. That's the world we live in. How long has it been that way? What about travel? I came here this morning in a car that started when I pushed a button. It was air conditioned. It had power steering. It had power brakes. It had an automatic transmission. The windows went up and down at the touch of a button. I could adjust the seat by touching the button. And if I was smart enough, it would tell me how to get to church if I knew how to use the GPS. <laughs> and my car is probably not any different than your car. How long has it been that that could do that? I could talk to my computer in the car and said, I want to go and see the White House in Washington, D.C., can you direct me? And somebody comes out of the speaker and says, turn right at the next corner, and the next corner, and the next corner, and the next corner. How long has that been that that's possible in human history? 
You talk about airplane flights. How long has it been that we can go any place we want in the world in about a day? Halfway around the world, either way, in about a day. All you have to do is take your IOU card, talk to somebody and type in here, I permit you to take some numbers off my mythical bank account, give me a ticket, be on an airplane as far away as Australia, right? Several times a year. It's fun to Google or ask Surrey how many people, how many airplanes are flying in the United States right now? They have these transponders and it's there and you can get to the right little site and it shows these airplanes going. And there are approximately 5,000 commercial airplanes over the United States right now. 5,000. Each with 100, 200 people in it. And the statistics say you're safer in that airplane than driving to the airport. How long has that been? That's just at the end of the string that's 60 feet long. Let's talk about war. Christ said in Matthew 24 that there will be wars till the end of time. And if you would take a survey of the population of the world and you say, think war's a good idea or war's a bad idea, what do you think the vote would come out? Essentially, everybody would say war is a terrible idea. Christ said, nevertheless, there is enough selfishness that wars are not going to stop till the end of time. When you look at your news, you look at the newspaper, and there's this conflict and that conflict and the next conflict, you say, yeah, it's exactly what the Bible said was going to happen. World War I, which is the war to win all wars, maybe 18 million people died. Within 25 years, we had World War II. And there were 50 plus million people who died. And at the end of that war, we dropped two nuclear weapons, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the scientists tell us, compared to what we have now, those are pretty small. But what is interesting, there has never been another one. And it's 70 years of human history. Even though Russia has them, and England has them, and Israel has them, and India has them, and Pakistan has them, and Korea has them, and Iran wants them, and so on, there's never been any more nuclear weapons dropped. And I don't know if that's a fulfillment of prophecy or not. You'd have to interpret it, but Revelation says the angels are holding the four winds. Maybe that's a proof of that. Not only that, we can deliver our weapons like we never could before. During World War II, we bombed the enemy. From England, we flew to Germany and we bombed the enemy. And they would send over a hundred bombers or more in a group with a Norton bomb site, which is the best thing they had, and try to hit the target. And they said, if you came within a half mile, you hit the target. And they had so many bombers because basically they missed most of the time. Now, with GPS and modern missiles, drones, airplanes, you can put a nuclear weapon at any address on the face of the earth and it will not miss. Recently in the news you saw the Tommy Hawk missiles because they were having germ warfare in uh, Syria and made the decision we're going to destroy that airport 
And those missiles took off from destroyers and flew several hundred miles, and they had to decide which end of the hangar they were going to hit. The GPS knows exactly where that thing has gone, and they did not miss. How long has that been in the stream of time? Talk about modern medicine. One foot ago, or 1900, the average lifespan was 48 or 49 years. Now the average lifespan is 75 to 80 years. We've had a 30, 40, 50 percent increase in lifespan. Nothing like that in Earth's history. Nothing. But interesting enough, the first prophecy in the Bible says, Thou shalt surely die, and it's still true. As much as we fight and drag our heels and try not to die, and that's my business, and that's how I make a living, people don't want to die. The prophecy is still true. Everyone that's born has the death sentence, and it has not changed. Modern medicine, you can now, and they do it quite a few times uh, every week, even in even town as small as Reading, is that you can stop the human heart. You can repair the valves. You can replace arteries with veins, restart the human heart. The heart-lung machine takes over during that time, and usually it goes well. How long in human history has that been true? How long have we had vaccines that have essentially eliminated smallpox and polio, mumps and rubella and roseola, tetanus? Just down at the end. What about knowledge? How much do we know compared to what we used to know? Now, you can look into human history and realize that the people who built the pyramids were very, very, very bright. You can read whole books, and I've got one on the building of the pyramids, how much they knew about astronomy, how much they knew about geometry, how much they knew. You had to do all kinds of calculations to get that thing to come out right. So they weren't stupid, but how much did they really know compared to what we know? It was not until 1953 that Watson and Crick worked out the way the atoms combined together to make the molecule DNA, in which is the code for life itself. 1953, that's right down at the end of the road. 23 chromosomes, and now they have worked out approximately 3 billion base pairs for the human chromosome. That's just happened. There was a time when you used to go to the library. How many of you have been to the library recently? Homeless here at the library. Bathrooms and air conditioning and computers. We now have in our pocket essentially the library. And I don't have to use the blankety blank Dewey Decimal System, which I always had to go get the librarian to help me. And she was saying, How can this guy be so dumb? He can't find a book in the library. Now I simply talk to this thing, and I ask it a question, you know, when did Napoleon die? In a couple of seconds it tells me. You realize what has happened in that little transaction? I have a thought in my mind, I speak, I make the air vibrate a little bit. 
there's a microphone on this thing that hears and senses the vibration of that air, turns it into pluses and minuses, zeros and ones, or whatever you want to say, and sends that information by a radio to the local tower who sends it who knows where and makes a word out of that vibration in the air. Takes a series of words and makes it into a question goes through all its data and answers the question in a second or two. Did any of you six inches ago dream that that would be possible? I mean, Dick Tracy with his magic watch didn't do that. But that's the world we live in. That's the world we live in. What about the world's population? It is estimated that there were maybe 300 million people on the face of the earth when Christ lived back there 2,000 years ago. One foot ago, 1900 or so, there was 1.9 billion. Now, there's seven and a half billion. In the last foot of this stream of human history, the population of the earth has quadrupled. There's nothing like that in human history. And there's, there's other things that you can talk about, many other things you could talk about. The question that I ask at the beginning, could you convince your friend who asked you why the Bible was true, that it was true? You can say, well, I heard this crazy nutwit give a sermon on a string and said that the Bible predicted that at the end of time, knowledge would be increased, that men would run to and fro, it predicted that poverty would not go away. It predicted that people would hate each other and keep going to war. So on and so on. And very often, we try to f make people frightened that the end is coming. We've done that for 150 years. When he didn't come, it just died down. Fear as a long-term motivator is lousy. But the good news is, the story of the Bible does not stop there. It tells us the truth about what a mess our world is and could be, but it ends up saying, It's going to end. There's going to be a resurrection, a recreation. And all our problems are going away. Forever. Forever. I had another prop. I realized I forgot it. Do any of the children that are here for the children's story know what this is? Are there any gray hairs who don't know what this is? How rapidly our world has changed. This was my mother's. Kept it because she used to use it at times. How long have you, since you've used one of these? It's a wonderful product. Ideal for silks, hosiery, and lingerie, or handkerchiefs. Just the right size to fit in a bucket, the pail, or the laboratory. It packs easily into suitcases for traveling. So Karen, next time you go to Shangri-La, you want to borrow this? This is not that old. 
in human history, this is right down here, and yet it's, it's an antique. Our world is changing very, very rapidly. I don't know if the fig tree has um, sprouted or not. That's for you to decide. But Christ said, keep your antenna up. And I'm convinced, in, and I consider myself, of course, to be young, that things are changing very, very, very rapidly. Our capacity to know things, our capacity to destroy each other, is changing very, very rapidly. But our morality has not. Even though we know so much, we're still selfish, we're still immoral, we're still greedy. Christ said that is the way it's going to be. Most of us are against that. We're waiting for the recreation. Human history is fascinating. I know of no other book that has told the truth about the world that we now live in better than the Bible. Kind Heavenly Father, it is a fearful thing and a great thing and a wonderful thing to live in the world we live in. We look forward to the next world. Amen.